hi everybody. I wanted to um, say and, and um, thank you all for joining us. This has been, um, it's just been a great day. It's been a great pleasure to get the opportunity to meet um, Melissa Brown, who is a fabulous resource. So I'm really excited about today's webinar and hope that um, it will provide um, a lot of useful and actionable information for all of you. Just to give you a little background, um, my name is Amy DeVita, and I am launched Third Sector today just about a year ago to help nonprofits um, and provide tips and insights and best practices from around the, the country, um, potentially around the world, to um, help everybody elevate cause and also help you in advancements in your career as well, which is very important. So first, let me say thank you all for joining us, uh, taking the time out of your crazy busy schedule. Um, greatly appreciated. So thanks for joining us, and we hope that this is going to be really helpful as you look into the future planning for your organization and all your raising efforts. Um, so in that vein of being practical um, and having actionable content, what better type of information to bring to folks than um, to display, to share with you the results and findings of research. So Melissa is here to discuss what works in fundraising. This is based on her survey um, from the Nuffet Research Collaborative that pulled a thousand nonprofit organizations, and she'll get into it um, in the in the webinar. But gives you a good understanding of what's working and what isn't in fundraising. So let's look learn from those who are doing well. That's what I like. To also recognize um, Donor Perfect, um, they are one partner of ours, and, and I just want to say that without them, um, this webinar and Third Sector Today just wouldn't be around to help anybody. So um, I do want to say thanks again to Donor Perfect, and, and for you out there, if you're not familiar with them, you can check them out at DonorPerfect.com and see why um, they get such great ratings from folks like Idealware and N10 and customers. So in any case, um, moving along, I would love to introduce um, Melissa Brown and, and explain to you a little bit about Melissa. Um, she is, is awful lot of research background and is, is, I'm very envious of somebody who's able to capture and, and uh, analyze and to use, assimilate all of this information data. So Melissa Brown, um, first of all, she's principal of Melissa Brown and Associates. And Melissa F. Brown and Associates. Um, she has more than 20 years of experience in nonprofit um, organizations, man programs, raised funds. She um, studied charitable giving in the U.S. Um, and a highly acclaimed trainer for the fundraising school. Heard of that? Um, very honor, very prestigious. Melissa has, um, has absolutely wonderful and providing so much information for the, the sector. So, so it's my honor. Thank you, Melissa, for joining us. I'm going to hand the presentation uh, over to you at this point. Hopefully <laughs> this goes slowly. Um, it will. <laughs> and Melissa, oh, before I forget, I'm sorry. I do this all the time. I just want to let everybody know that this um, webinar is being recorded, A, so you'll be receiving a, a, a link later today that you can listen to it on demand or share it with somebody, which is great. Um, but also, Melissa is going to make some time for us at the end of the presentation for questions and answers. So please um, stay with us, submissions and um, not your answers, but submit your questions to me. Uh, through the chat box or within the um, box, and I will be happy to share that. So, thank you. And with that, Melissa, please take it. Thank, thank you, Amy, very much. It's great to be here. Um, the, this, uh, based on work, uh, sorry, as Amy said, it's called Nonprofit Fundraising Survey. It's put out um, by the, the Nonprofit Research Collaborative. We do these studies twice a year. Uh, so, this came out Monday. And I'm very glad that you're with us to do the uh, the too long don't read version. Um, fine. Uh, there is a full report 
at npresearch.org, which is at the bottom of the, the here, npresearch.org. And there's also an infographic. So if there's something that you would like to um, share colleagues uh, in an infographic format, that's there as well. Everything's free. So we did the survey in July and August. We asked questions about um, giving to uh, the middle of June, I mean, end of June, sorry, in 2014, compared to the prior year. And fairly representative of the nonprofit sector. So it's, it's reliable. Um, we've we've tracked this over time, and we know that our survey questions actually are pretty pretty good for um, helping get a, a read on what's going on for the full year. Um, so great, Melissa. You told us what you studied and who you studied, but what did you find? We found just over half of the organizations in this particular wave, uh, half of the 1,180, said that they were raising more at the first half of this year than at the first half of 2013. That's the green segment of the pie chart that you see there on the on the green. And 22% said they were raising about the same. 6% were raising less. Now, I have to tell you, every time we've done this survey, somewhere between, between 15 and 25% at least have been raising less. It's not unusual. It's very common um, for someone to raise less, and there are very good reasons for that. So they to um, whether they're in a campaign or not in any one year. Some relate to whether they've lost a staff member, all kinds of things that you can you can think think of. Um, um, half, more than half are raising more. That's somewhat unusual. This is only the third time that we've done this survey where we've seen more than half. Uh, raising more. We, we started doing it in 2010. So we're encouraged that, that over the organizations are raising more as of the middle of the year. And remember, the beginning of this year was very, very tough. We had six weeks in the winter when much, many parts of the country had, you know, snow day after snow day, after ice day, after fog day, after snow day. So um, we're, in, those, in light of those circumstances, we're still, we just think it's great that half are raising more. So that's wonderful, but was it by different parts of the country? Not really. You can see by the green, the green bars there across the top that it's around half in every part of the country. That section of the, the west that looks like it's much higher, uh, just aren't enough respondents for that difference to be statistically significant between 57% and 51%. So um, even though it looks like a big difference, um, given the number of respondents in that part of the country, it's it not to that we can count on as showing up over and over and over if we kept doing this survey. And if anybody's aligned from Canada, we do see that 54% of the respondents in Canada also said that they were raising more in the first year. Usually Canada lags the U.S. So, um, so that's neat that the Canadian respondents were seeing the same kind of uptick that an uptick the American respondents did. So important to notice that the gray segments and the pink segments, the middle a bottom part of those, those, those graphs are also very similar to each other. Um, so one region that's spring or gaining more than any other region. It's very, it's very evenly distributed across the country and, and it, between the two countries, the U.S. and Canada. So sectors. When we talk about subsectors in research, we mean the big categories, arts, education, environment, across health, human services, international affairs, public society benefit, which is United Ways and Jewish federations and some other things, and then in religion. So with the, the, the sub-bars by subsector, uh, arts and education, which have the big, bold 58%, that is higher than the rest of the other organizations. That is a statistically significant difference. Um, so organizations and education organizations in this study, there were enough to say they were really performing better at the first of this year than they were at the first half of last year, and better the rest of the organizations in this study. Those little bars, the, the ones that said 49%, 48% that are in red there, health and human services, we also have lots of respondents in those categories. Those categories were form, performing less as well. Um, it's statistically significant that the than half in those two a group performing less well, and it, many people on the line might be from those subsectors, and and it's helpful to know <laughs> that you know distribution is very different, and um, it's it's be, it's becoming tougher for human services organizations than a year ago. The categories that are in white either aren't different, like society benefit, or too small. 
um, you know, an environment. Um, we typically don't have enough respondents to to do a statistical analysis for them. So to put uh, organizations that that relative people of relatively high income tend to support arts and education groups, and health and human services, which are supported by people of all income. And so you could make a story out of that if you wanted to, but um, the, the, that's one way to think about it. Um, so all these different organizations are out there. What are they different? Are they raising money using different methods? Are they, are they making their case differently? What's, if there are differences by subsector, maybe, maybe because they're doing fundraising in different ways. No. Um, when we look at the organizations uh, and the different methods that they use, and we ask about 15 different methods, um, it's very common for an organization to ask their board members to give. 90% of all the charities did. It's very common for organizations to ask for major gifts. Somewhat less common, 66% ask for gifts or resland gifts. So that's pretty um, to, for a lower percentage. It's very common, almost 90% for an organization to send requests by mail and uh, that, uh, kind of online fundraising not just help, but you know don't donate here buttons or something like that um, that's also 80% uh, and you can see all, all the way along 81% had spent 75% use email appeals and use the, the, the house over there in the purple section all the way on the right patient grants and corporate giving are also used by 9 out of 10 different organizations so most types of organizations are using some fundraising that's sort of face-to-face, -face, board giving and major gifts, some fundraising that's asking the ordinary donor, uh, mail or online or special events, and fundraising that's an institutional appeal, foundation grants and corporate giving. Others use some of the other methods as well, but those, those seven or eight methods are really uh, uh, used in every organization. Six of fundraising, that being the difference in why some organizations are succeeding more than other organizations. So, did any one type of method do perform particularly well during this compared to others? And the answer is that uh, these methods, uh, again, green indicates that they're doing better in the first half of this year than they, they were in the first half of last year. In terms of the amount that they received, um, the gray is that they're receiving the same, and the pink is that they actually saw decreases in the first half year. And then the darker gray that's at the top is um, organizations that are using the method but aren't actually tracking um, whether it's how, how it does over time. And you'll see other online, for example, 26% don't track, 26% track, um, that use that method don't track whether um, how, how it is in the first half of the year versus the first half of the year. Anyway, the point here is none of these bars, these green and gray bars, are different from the from what they were a year ago. We've seen a dramatic change in, in um, what percentage are seeing major gifts increase, what percentage are seeing foundation grants change, what percentage are seeing foundation special events, the second bar over from the right. These look very much like they did last year. So it's not the mix of methods that's mad, that makes that's making a difference. And it's not really any one method that's outperforming or underperforming compared to where it was a year ago. That is not explaining why higher ed and are somewhat the game here, why health and, and uh, human services organizations are lagging behind. We ju we're just not seeing that in the data at this point. point. Some difference in fundraising methods, uh, but uh, I haven't. There is one. Uh, uh, sorry, another. These are less frequently used methods. Um, not those bars. Uh, but the ones that are used by. by of, the, of these, and these also are not significantly different from last year in terms of their percentages that are seeing growth or change. You will see that there are riskier methods in general, even though frequently used. These are all based on who's using them, and a third or less are seeing growth in every one of these methods. So the method that you're considering going to, um, texting, uh, SMS texting, for example, or, or possibly reaching out into social media, um, you might 
work with your organization to have some very, very modest projections for what the returns will be um, as you start because the uh, immediate success does not seem to, to be the norm on, on the particular uh, respondents in this survey. Missed, missed a slide, going back. back. Thank you for your patience. So everyone uses everything, or most people, most organizations use top top uh, top methods for giving major gifts, uh, email, email, you foundation grants, corporate grants. And very many differences by subsector. You don't see that on the slide, but I actually did a an analysis that showed, you know, in human services, if they're you know, if they're major compared to everybody else's major gifts, um, major gifts foundation grant and so forth. And there are very few differences. There are, there are only um, really four. Uh, education is more likely to see growth in major gifts than actors are. Well, that's sort of a duh. We know that education organizations have uh, have staffed development offices. They have loyal alumni groups. They have ongoing annual appeals, and they often structure campaigns. So major gifts is not such a, a big shock to us that education would see less than major gifts. Edu organizations are also reporting uh, more likely to report growth in receiving online gifts and might be attributable to, to their staffing. They might have the capacity to do more online than uh, other organizations and they, they might have more to communicate. You know, it's wonderful they have a student body with thousands of students who are you know, we have pretty terrific stories to tell about how education is changing their lives. Human relations, in contrast, are less likely to see growth in major gifts in this, these past six months and less likely to see gifts in growth online in these past six months. And, um, um, ones that we know from prior research, not this study, but other research, is that um, services organizations have diverted their fundraising staff um, to, they maintain the same level of staffing, but they focus on the most likely opportunities at the moment. So uh, rather than necessarily having a well-structured uh, program that has people in proposals and people doing the annual fund and people doing major gifts and having somebody else who's doing corporate gifts, there be one or two people who are doing a little bit of all of those things, and when uh, opportunities arise with foundations, then they stop doing annual fund. Or when the government um, issues a request for a proposal or notices of funding availability, they'll stop working with individual donors and start writing proposals for the government. So it's quite possible, I can't prove it, but it's possible that these organizations have um, somehow shifted their staff allocations in the past uh, month to a year, so the less on raising funds in major gifts, less on raising money online, and maybe more on direct mail, more on um, um, so uh, the, the choice, a different set of choices about how human services organizations invest in fundraising. We did see this time that plan giving is less likely to be on the rise in arts and public society benefit. Um, I, I can explain that. Uh, nobody can time when a planned gift is going to mature, when, when the uh, state actually disperses funds to the nonprofit recipient. So it's very hard to um, dig the causes of changes in planned gifts uh, in just one, one survey. There's, there's the years of surveys to, to, to learn whether arts or public society benefit organizations are investing differently in plan giving than other types of organizations are. But that was that was one difference. The key the key difference is the um, major gifts in education compared to to human services. So it's everything, and there are very few methods by subsector. What's really happening in the organizations that are not seeing growth? So they've been in the gray or the pink sections, that first pie chart that we looked at. What was organizations not to uh, see funds rise, even at a time when em employment is going up, when the stock market's been going up, and when uh, predictors of house giving are actually increasing. So, uh, um, the uh, types of giving, again, and we looked at whether 
uh, rising or, or or declining in different organizations where, where gifts were going up overall compared to gifts or where, where gifts were going down overall. So this particular graph, the green bar represents organizations where total fundraising receipts are increasing. That's the green section of that first pie chart. And the anchor reddish bar um, represents organizations where all receipts are going down. And we just see if, if there's one method or a set of methods that was failing or organizations that were decreases or that was doing super, super well for organizations that were seeing increases. Were organizations that were seeing increases you know, super likely to getting major gifts, for example, compared to to to, uh, to other organizations. Well, we do in fact see that majors are an important part of um, the thing for organizations that are seeing increases. Sixty-six percent of the organizations that are increases um, are are seeing the um, um, in major gifts. Sixty um, percent. And 14% of organizations that are um, not doing well. Recognize these are only organizations that use these methods. This is anybody who doesn't use major gifts. This is just focused on the, the groups that are using it. So there's a, there is a big difference in whether major gift money is coming in for organizations um, that are that are feeding or not. There, but notice there are differences in every single method. It is major gifts. It's the, all those other methods are showing not that big a gap, at least a gap, and they are statistically significant in every single case. It is organizations to raise money, no matter what method they're using, then it is those organizations naturally that are, are seeing their receipts decrease. It does seem to matter what mix of method they're using. It doesn't seem to matter um, and it, it's somehow that organizations seeing decreases are seeing decreases some through all of their methods, and that was through uh, that came through in some of the comments as well when we asked people to explain their results. Um, this sort of profound implication: it, you, organizations that are facing a tough time are not going to be looking for the silver bullet that will fix the problem. Problem. There, it's probably a fundraising process where they need some attention on the process that will that will help them. And indeed, um, the, the we we more deeply into the human services organizations in particular. There are a lot of them in the nonprofit research collaborative uh, response pool, and we were trying to figure out which organizations in human services are facing such a difficulty. This is one of the areas that was fairly concerning um, given in the the organizations in the subsector overall. It's the largest type of nonprofit in the country. And we see that um, the compared with the middle 2013, there are in fact some fairly big organizations that are um, that are meeting and raising. So in the, the middle of 2013, in the middle section of the of the graph, the organizations that had a million to three million in expenditures. In 2013, the darker green bar there, 71% were seeing their, their total gift receipts increase. And commitments only 54%. Fairly well staffed, fairly well organized human services organizations that probably have fairly successful development programs because they, they wouldn't be able to sustain their operations at that that level of the expansion budget. In, and they're still seeing a decline in. And, uh, fundraising results. Um, the drop in fundraising, it's a lower percentage are seeing an increase. And that's true also for the even larger organizations. Everything from 1 million up to over 10 million, you can for the 40% and the 52%. Um, those organizations in human services in particular are um, um, challenges right now. And we, we wanted to understand and more about what was going on, uh, not only in human services, but in all organizations um, where, where they're not benefiting from this improving economy. So, 
um, we all asked if organizations the whole year would be down. We had only asked about the first half of the year, and then so then we we also asked if they were on track to meet their goals for the whole year. And, and the bigger you are, the bigger the organization is, the more likely you are to think that even on a, a meeting at seeing any now you will meet your goals. Ask organizations about that. Why will you? you what when you're on track? And they were on track in part because the early 2014 was tough, as I mentioned. Um, they have great plans. They're implementing plans. They can see results from their plans, even though uh, they might not have been uh, seen half of this year. And in some cases, they already know about big gifts. Sorry about my dog. They see about big gifts that they haven't um, been made yet, but they've already been committed. Um, they just haven't been, been okay, which hasn't been received. So the fact that almost nine out of ten of the very largest organizations um, are predicting that they will meet their goals is also very encouraging. Um, and it's very difficult for small groups to be less likely to uh, they'll meet their goals, and for large groups to think they'll meet them. But um, we, we all historically um, the per day they'll meet their goals is usually a little bit lower than those that actually do. So. Or that they're having met their goal is, is likely to be a little bit higher than this. Okay, this is the question here. What is working? Not the mix of um, methods necessarily. It's not any one method that's being used. It's not being, it, it might be being in any one subsector, health or human services or arts education, that might be part of it. Um, it be size. Larger tend to um, experience uh, uh, best from their donors than organizations that are smaller. We ask the organizations that are, are meeting their goals, what's working for you? What is driving your success? Um, this, these coding, uh, these choices, these are coding uh, codes made uh, analyzed by two different analysts who, who look open-ended responses. Most organizations, nearly nearly 80% of the organizations that, that gave an answer to this question and that are seeing growth in funds rate, fundraising results are talking about organizational capacity. They're talking staff to do the work. They're talking about having board members who volunteer, uh, actually engage in fundraising. They're talking about having fundraising plans, monitoring. They're talking about having um, databases that support their fundraising, um, owner-centric Process, all of those things are part of organizational capacity. Forty-three. You could. They could have picked. They could have said anything. And some people said more than one thing. So forty-three percent also talked about decisions made by donors. They said schools are giving more, or banks are giving more, something like that. So it's it's the other side of organizational capacity when we ask effectively and we ask the right people for the right amount of money at the right time. Donors and the, and the gift is uh, realized. 27% offered some other kind of answer. You know, it's up, it's up everywhere, or um, we had a really good uh, best received in early 2014 um, at one-time event, or maybe just the economy in our area is really good and people are giving, something like that. Sort of general um, statement or a, such a specific statement that it couldn't really be, be rated in coding. So the big picture of coding, and let's drill down a little bit further to it. Um, you have this... Uh, there's a sort of wave bars on the top and solid blue bars in the middle and then um, kind of red bars at the bottom. Those be green bars at the top are uh, some, something related to the general economy or some unusual circumstance. So um, timing. Well, we, somebody who, who usually gives us a gift gave it earlier this year. That might be why they're up in the, and, and doing well in the middle of 2014. Um, it may be an anniversary year. Um, in some cases, 2013 was unusually low, and so that of where they were uh, at this time last year, because for some reason last year was off. And then six percent said that a single gift made the difference. This was often a bequest uh, had been, had, that was received that had been provided. And some 18 percent said just some general giving is up everywhere. Is um, much more interesting uh, for, from our point of view because these circumstances we can control. Um, concern fundraising goal is that we, they said 
or said we took a really hard look at our numbers and we decided this that this was the goal that we could support based on our giving history and so that was the goal we went with this is the next group some of the that had a out we uh, fundraising goal it's about the clarity of their organization's mission and how compelling it is to donors just the mission itself it's about great board engagement they said their board is really ready to go they had active development committees um, they had board members who were leading the way with giving eight for that uh, they had some kind of campaign it could have been a special uh, campaign it could have been a capital campaign and that's uh, part of why they were um, doing well compared to the prior year. Uh, talked about 13% talked about having donor-focused initiatives or good stewardship practices. And donor, donors know how they're making a difference. Um, the organization is using the funds that the donor contributes to actually better people's lives. Uh, 3% talked about having a plan have organization-wide commitment to raising and monitoring the processes and the, and the steps along the way to make sure that uh, the plan implemented and that the, everybody in the organization knew the importance of fundraising. Just percent report, reported that they were asking in effective ways. They were using email and direct mail and uh, information in newsletters and telephone calls. It, it, whatever combination was making sense for them. They were reaching different people using many different methods, and some pe people um, using the specific method that that person preferred. We are stage in our um, the evolution of communications that that oh people need to hear or see something four times. Marketers tell us fourteen different times for them to remember it. So um, organizations that are succeeding are taking advantage of the mul multiple multiplicity of ways that we can reach donors to educate. Um, of the organization and how a gift makes a difference. And then this was, was also very important. Stink and leadership are prepared and committed to fundraising. 50% of the respondents offered some kind of comment to this effect. We have staff to do the work, uh, hired a develop, director of development, invested in training our team. We uh, brought our uh, um, director and our board uh, committee to brought a training session together so that they're prepared for fundraising. Some kind of um, indication that the people actually need to do uh, the do the request, the face-to-face -face request, who need to prepare all the materials, that they're, they're enabled, they're empowered to do that work. You can set uh, four percent credited bequests. Um, they talked about plan giving, having invested in plan giving, having bequest amounts rece um, amounts received um, that were increasing over time, in part because they'd invested in plan giving in the past. Helen spoke specifically about having special event events up, and that was not necessarily from sponsorships; it often was uh, from event participation um, by members of the general constituency. Um, institutional donor dollars, those are foundations and corporations, um, and 30% reported seeing increases from uh, grants made or gifts from, from those types of donors, and then 14% said that they were seeing increases from, from individual givers. So one of the key points here is that investment in the middle section here, clarity of mission, board engagement, donor with stewardship, asking, using multiple channels, having staffing and leadership that are committed to fundraising and prepared to do it, is, is associated with seeing increases in institutional dollars, seeing increases in individual donors, and donor dollars, and also seeing in, uh, increases in events. So, I also ask the organizations that are not seeing increases, so what's not going right? Some of the problems. And this is coding from uh, what they wrote in. They, they write in anything they wanted. And um, the uh, organizational capacity related issues again were were the majority with half of the respondents just over half had some kind of concern about organizational capacity the two percent said related to how donors are making their choices um, individual donors aren't giving as much to us or something like that and then fourteen percent mentioned some kind of eco economic local economy issue or, or competent in, in their area 
or possibly one-time events, um, usually associated with a big gift in 2013 that located in 2014. Let's take a look at uh, some of their um, detailed reasons. Um, same um, voting structure, the economy or unusual circumstances at the top in the green wavy boxes, organal capacity questions in the middle in the boxes, and then donor decisions um, there at the bottom. In, in percent of the cases, people said, well, we, we're meeting our goal, but it's a it's really small gap. It's, it's almost too small to say that we, we didn't meet it. That was 1%. Uh, some people spoke about government funding and how a um, particular type of charity has, has not received government funding. Um, some people mentioned that 2013 had a very, hard, uh, very high gift, and so 2014 was low in comparison. And then nine people spoke specifically about um, their low economy. Uh, things being tougher in their local economy or having more competition in their community of nonprofit dollars. But in contrast to other organizations um, that succeeding, these groups felt the lack of organization, organizational capacity. Um, so they, had, they were new to fundraising. They hadn't had a staff before or they, they, uh, they uh, poorly organized before, so they were restructuring their their approach. So that's organizational capacity. They're building, but they haven't seen the results yet. Astoundingly to me, 3% spoke about having a reduced budget for fundraising. The board has, had cut their fundraising budget. Other work that, that had been done has shown that when you cut the budget for fundraising, you do receive less in, in funds. Um, um, it's a, a choice for an organization that's cutting fund money for fundraising. And it will almost surely see less money raised um, in Thropic support. Um, four that talked about how the board was not interested in fundraising, was not supportive of fundraising, um, did it from fundraising in some cases. So um, the opportunities there for these organizations perhaps to work with their CEOs or their directors to try to change how the board approaches the, the subject or help change some of the board membership. So um, there's the board in fundraising. 7% um, mentioned that um, the challenge in having an annual fund and a capital campaign at the same time. Um, and again, that's, that's link capacity in part because um, they're understaffed for that particular combination, or the capital campaign might not have been um, such a way with a feasibility study and some advanced work so that it was uh, um, a success. 11% here said the goal was too high. I'm going to other question of organizational capacity on the prior screen, 3% there said the goal was very conservatively set, meeting their goals in part because the goal is very reasonable. And 11% of the respondents said that, um, for another, their goal, their, their advisor in some cases, or their board or the executive director set the goal unreasonably high and, and was not the, that thing was not tied to the organization's act fundraising performance in the past said that we're missing critical staff members or time for staff members or um, in some cases the commitment from the CEO or other key staff members to make fundraising successful. Um, there are ways to overcome this. There's training, there's recruitment, there's um, the uh, babies that board members can take to start making phone calls. Uh, they feel good about engaging with donors to, to build organizational capacity, and I have some suggestions at the end um, in some courses about how to learn about that. And again, I'll go back to these issues of capacity. These same organizations are seeing that their bequest amounts are down, in some cases their event pro proceeds are down, individual dollars, individual donor dollars are down, and 18% say that institutional donor dollars were down. Um, and it's quite a direct relationship between um, um, having goals too high or, or having staff and leadership that aren't prepared for fundraising and, and um, the, the dollars that are being contributed by different kinds of donors, whether individuals or institutions. So we're interested, we asked everybody what they were doing that was working, and um, we were interested in what some of the smaller organizations in particular were telling us. Organizations that traditionally have a tough time with fundraising, 
And this, um, this, I've got some quotations here to give you a flavor of uh, things that people see. This person is excited, all of these exclusion points. Um, this is Canadian Arts Organization. We were able to increase staffing support and fundraising expertise through professional development, better plan, and administrative funding. We have already exceeded our goals. We went in mid-2012. This particular group is on a calendar year. So they've, half a year, they've met for the whole year and through staffing and planning. Uh, this is another question on the survey. We asked people if they were raising money from, from the, the particular area that they serve, and um, which tells us that our constituents are the most likely um, to us, whoever the beneficiaries, whoever we're serving in some cases. And in fact, that, that was something made a difference so that as you plan, I would organizations where they can to think about raising money from the communities, the actual people that they're serving in their service area. I work homeless programs. It's always possible. I do realize that, but um, it, when it, it's associated with raising more, more money. Some examples of success. This is a Western environmental organization. Again, with a, a relatively small budget, we're planning to do a job at engaging our board and significantly increasing our major gift donations. Organization, strategic goals and objectives, weekly development meetings, uh, and long term planning. And very small religious organization, less than a half a million budget, um, work with great stories to tell from donors. All clear about the goal, meeting or exceeding it, and having board members make thank you calls. It's a very common way for board mm -hmm. members to be to begin to be involved. So if they're reluctant to be fundraisers, sometimes they'll be fund thankers and start to get excited about contacting with donors. So last uh, slide, so get your questions ready if you have them. <laughs> I'd stress setting realistic goals, using your organization's historical record for fundraising, not some kind of budget gap filling fundraising goal. It needs to be based on um, your your amount you've raised in the past, what's in the pipeline, where you think you might be uh, able to to work donors to have them upgrade to a higher giving level or create a giving club or whatever to to get some realistic goals. Working with board members and volunteers, in fact, the nonprofit research collaborative has a special report about working with board members. Uh, came in September 2012. Um, sizes of organizations can work with board members in different ways. Um, seems to be helpful. Of a plan, plan. We showed that, that uh, working with the development committee to develop a um, a fund plan is very, very, very closely closely associated with raising more funds in one year over over the prior year. So having a plan, figuring how to how to implement it, is an essential step for fundraising. If you have a plan. plan you need to monitor your progress to goals. Otherwise, it just it becomes what a friend of mine calls a vinyl monument, sits on a shelf and doesn't really doesn't really guide any action. And then um, I learned through a lot of the work of Penelope Burke and Adrian Sargent and many others, excellent stewardship and communications. Donors want to know what we're doing with their money. They want to know the impact. They want to know stories. Some of them like data as well as stories. But they need to know that their investment is really changing people's lives for the better. So to the extent that organizations are able to do that, that seems to be associated with fundraising as well. Um, I do have the resources slide, and as Amy said, you'll you'll receive um, as part of your package, your, your participant package. So you don't need to sit and write these down. They'll come to you in your email. We have 15 minutes left or so for questions, so if you have anything, please shoot them out to, to Amy, and I'll do what I can. I will. Thank you, Melissa. Um, can you, I need to say thank you. That was um, an incredible amount of information. Um, we do have some questions, and I am keeping an eye on the panel okay. um, on the side here, too. So if anybody else has additional questions, submit them now, please. Um, um, question, actually, I'm not sure how quick this is, but from Colin. Um, Colin was wondering if putting in the framework of 
looking at keyword placement SEO, so talking about online. Um, sure. Do you have any, um, any correlation between search rank and receipt? Was that really a good question. question. We don't track that. We let N, um, N10 track all of the online fundraising particulars. So mm -hmm. N, N and then spell out 10. N, uh, does the, they do their it's, report. Yeah. Uh, Touch in the panel. Oh, great. Um, and I, I don't actually remember, Colin, that they uh, that they did something on um, SEO and placement. Um, if they didn't, they are structuring a new report right now, so it's a good time to ask them the question so you could go uh, possibly in the survey for next year. I can take business. It's been great, but um, I don't know about nonprofits. <laughs> Right. Well, you know, that leads me to, uh, I'm selfishly going to jump in and ask a question. Yes, um, that leads me to my question, Melissa. Um, my background is really in, from the, I'm from the for-profit world. So, you're going through these findings, I see, if I'm correct, um, that organizational capacity seems to be one of the big drivers is to fix or meeting. I touch my head, my for-profit head, because I say, you know, in the for-profit world, there's a phrase that you got to spend money to make money. Um, but for some reason, in the nonprofit world, it does not. It's it's it, that that method or that saying just right. doesn't play well. I guess. Um, right. Can you speak a little bit to that? Do you think that? that can you a little bit to that? Um, how? How can we, as the people who are here and engaged right now, go back to our boards or work our organizations and say, well, we really do need to lay out some money because we're going to find that works. we end up bringing in more. Yeah. So, right. So. I, I have, I have uh, two comments. One is, this is a quotation from somebody. I know the name of the person, but I do know he was a bishop in the Lutheran Church in the early 1990s. And he said, money is me where I cannot be. <laughs> so if someone wants to bring about change in the world and they can't go to West Africa to help people with Ebola or can't go to Oklahoma to help the um, immigrants to our country, but they want to be there, they're going to send money. And mm -hmm. there has to be an organized way to help them do that, can exercise their human compassion, and there has mm -hmm. to be a way to report back to them about what happened. Fundraising is the the professional fundraising is organizing the process to help see the opportunities, receive, track, and report back. Um, money cannot be, and so that's one way. About it. And then the second way is to say that the um, people who started the on overhead have planted. In other words, also back in the 1990s, there was a strong effort to look at organizational efficiency and critique and sometimes criticize the amount that organizations spend on quote overhead and mm -hmm. end quote. And fundraising is frankly a program service, so it's considered overhead. Mm -hmm. And organizations were slashing their uh, non program budgets in an effort to appease people whom they thought cared about overhead costs. And this was embedded by groups like Charity Navigator and GuideStar and some others who were reporting on overhead costs. Well, the, mm -hmm. those big organizations have issued a letter saying, wait, wait, mm -hmm. we're, we were wrong, we were wrong, donors really don't care about this. And so we're going to stop focusing on, on that. Part of that is helping our boards understand that, that we use money to meet our mission. And that there's and there's now evidence that just like in the business for-profit world, Amy, that you said, that if you do not invest in fundraising, you will not raise money. And that will compromise your ability to meet your mission. Uh, Research Collaborative mm -hmm. has this. I had a great story yesterday. In the UK, I haven't found the study yet, but in the UK, uh, some number of organizations were asked to 
released money from their reserves and reserves and invested in fundraising. And mm -hmm. over the course of the year, it was a fairly significant sum of money. Over the and the organizations that had released that amount of money and invested it in fundraising raised like ten times that amount um, average for their missions. And they, they, they were compared with a group of organizations that just left that money in the bank. And mm -hmm. if your interests were, it was not, not a thousand percent, right? So, um, um, yeah. So organizations that invested in fundraising saw it pay off with increases in funds received. If I can, if I can get that study, I'll put it on the, I'll put it on the slide so you can send it out too. Thank you. And um, I'd be interested in seeing any studies that show that organizations that don't invest in um, fundraising made fund a lot more money. <laughs> so, are there? I don't know that I see. Well, studies? I don't know. Uh, 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 the ALS, um, I've ever heard of, with no investment mm -hmm. by the organization, and the Ice Bucket Challenge raised them so much money. So, the only instance I've ever heard of where there was no investment in fundraising by the organization. And right, and that's going to so happen. And that was a herring. I mean, that is absolutely a, a, it's a, a, a video going viral. You can't, you know, can't yeah. replicate it. It has to. Exactly. It just happens. It becomes first, or it doesn't. Right. I mean, 200 years of fundraising history. So don't count oh. it happening again. I'm not going to count that as a trend. Um, we have a question also from Elaine, who's been here patiently waiting for me to read her question. Um, she asks, do you have a simple donor communication template? We're a tiny organization at this time, and we're hitting this on almost every aspect, so simple tools are very helpful. I, wonderful I, idea. That's a great question, yeah. Um, Seen one, Elaine, and I'm going to have to dig it out, and I'll also send it to the. I'll put it on this resources tab for for Amy to send out. Um, okay. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, because uh, um, I think Gail Pay actually has a nice, nice one in her um, annual fund uh, that she's done with. Uh, she did a blog for Guide Star, and it's under for for donor communications. So you can Google her name, Gail G A I L, okay. and then okay. Perry. Um, she might be. Uh, a resource as well while I, while I dig through my memories to see what I can find. I to check in mine too. I um, am reading Claire Axelrad has some sure. fabulous tips and she's very, very focused on mm -hmm. um, the Penelope Burke, you know, our center mm -hmm. type of mm -hmm. fundraising. Um, I don't recall if there was a template, but I'm going to check back into my materials as well. So sure. Thank you, One Elaine. Of, yeah. One of the key uh, processes, Elaine, is now called a donor journey. And basically, whatever you decide to do, you standardize it for every donor. So if they give in February, by March, they've got some kind of letter back that says some of the great things that happened in, in uh, February and early March. And then, you know, by May, they get sign a report and a request for money. And then by June, something else happens and so forth. And that it's all, you know, based on the first month their, their gift is, everything's timed to... Um, can underestimate the value to a testing, which sure falls into something you do, yes. Melissa. <laughs> but um, let's assume that it, you set up a, a template, you set up a, um, pro, a process that you're going to use monthly, and let's say it's an email. Um, check your test, test and see, look back at your data, the data that you have available to you as to open rates, and check on things. I found this myself. How is the file? Um, is it too large? Is it cumbersome for people to open? Um, so how did it show up on a phone? We're seeing that 52 or more than 50% of emails are opened on smartphones. Um, how, does, how does your communication look when it's on a small screen like that? And how does your website look um, mm -hmm. also? But that leads me, um, sorry, I have a, another question. Melissa, do, um, I'm sorry, did you, were you finished with Elaine's question or, or did you have anything and, and else? Unless there's a follow-up from you, I'm, I, I, I have exhausted my knowledge on that topic, so we'll have to okay. dig around and send more out. Yeah. Well, um, and question going back to the different varieties uh, of the different channels, um, prof, um, mm -hmm. sorry, practices 
put in place um, or utilized by each of the organizations that respond. Um, I saw text or mass. Uh, I'm curious, I saw online, is there, did anybody differentiate? Is there a definition? How, how are we categorizing mobile giving versus mm. or text to give? Because those are two very different things. So is that going out separately? No, it's not. And there were only 7% that even said they used either one of those. So if we break it out mm -hmm. between mobile and SMS, it's uh, too few to analyze. And can you remind me about that? So I learned about this difference from you, but I learned it so well that I already forgot. So can you, do you have time to remember? Right now? <laughs> yeah, okay. sure. yeah, sure. Um, I mean, give is something where, let's say, great, um, let's say there's a disaster. Uh, that's not great, but there's a disaster, and you can text $5 gift. Uh, it will go through, it goes through your wireless carrier. They take, the, you know, they then um, process everything and then send along the proceeds after whatever they get compensated to the um, to the disaster relief fund that you've donated to. Um, but mobile giving is different. Mobile giving is being able to donate directly to, let's say, to your organization's site via a, um, an interface that's easy to use on your phone and it doesn't go through the carriers. I think that's probably the easiest way. It's not going mm -hmm. through the carrier. It's going directly to your organization. And uh, there are obviously platforms that do it, and they have they have their own um, pricing models. So for that, but you're again just um, it, it enables you to collect. collect. One of the biggest things is you know when somebody's excited and and passionate and moved to donate, you want them to be able to do that. So that's um, that's the difference. Um, sure. Okay. I know that I, I, I'm sorry if I didn't no, verbalize it. No, it's clearly, very clear. The, the text to give really is through, through the barrier, and then the mobile giving right. is as if your phone is your computer, and in what you might have you might have once done at a desktop or on a laptop, you can now do on your phone or your tablet. So. Correct. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. You, you put that thing so nicely. Um, you, 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 thank you. I might remember now. Um, I think that, let me see, looks we've come to the end question, maybe? Is there one? That's one more question. Did you, um, did you say mobile giving allows you to collect donor data? Uh, that, of course, would be another thing. That's almost like somebody reminding me that I, I forgot to mention something. But yes. Um, Coming from Y Lynn. Um, thanks for your question. Mobile giving, the mobile carrier, right? It's going through your site. Um, it does allow you to collect donor data, which is a very important. Is everything these days, in case you know, in case we don't know that, um, it's really, really important. Um, so the more you know about your organ, your donors, and your advocates, and your volunteers the more you can strategize so, um, and work with that. So thank you for that question. But yes, um, I didn't say it. I should have said it. But mobile does allow you to collect donor data. Texting. Um, other questions? I think, thank you. Um, well, this is really timed right that hour. Uh, I want to thank Melissa. Really appreciate it. Um, thank you for making the. Tra I know you had a lot of travel, and your intention has been incredibly useful to us. Thank you. Um, Pleasure. Check out the report and the infographic uh, at npresearch.org. Perfect. So npresearch.org, and mm -hmm. everybody will receive the. Um, the presentation, the recorded version of it, with a couple extra little pieces that we're going to track down in the meantime. And um, certainly can contact us. Uh, feel free to contact me anytime. I'm at amy at thirdsectorday.com. And um, Melissa, your email address. You I, have, to, I have several, but let's do melissa at npresearch.org for this one. There. So you can contact us and our contact info will be in the follow-up email as well. Um, thank you so much, everybody, for joining us. Keep doing what you're doing, and um, have a great rest of your afternoon. Take care.
Bye-bye. Thanks so much, Amy.